morning and welcome to the 15th annual Brattleboro Literary Festival. Um, this year's festival is made possible by the generous support of our sponsors, BCTV, Bobby Bristol, the Family Foundation Works, Vermont Arts Council, the Vermont Community Foundation, the Vermont Humanities Council, and Vermont Public Radio. We would also like to thank our advertisers and encourage you to support them. The festival is run by volunteers, so we urge you to make donations. Charlotte Gordon <coughs> is a critically acclaimed author whose newest book is Romantic Outlaws, The Extraordinary Lives of Mary Ro Wollstonecraft and Her Daughter Mary Shelley. It won the 2015 National Book Critics Circle Award. Brave, passionate, and visionary, Wollstonecraft and Shelley broke almost every rule there was to break. They had scandalous love affairs, bore children out of wedlock, chose to live in exile outside of their native country. Each in her own time fought against the injustices that women faced and wrote books that changed literary history. Early, earlier works include Mistress Bradstreet, the untold story of America's first poet, a Massachusetts honor book for nonfiction, and the woman who named God, Abraham's Dilemma and the Birth of the Three Faiths. She has also published two books of poetry, When the Grateful Dead Came to St. Louis and Two Girls on a Raft. A graduate of Harvard College, she received a master's degree in creative writing and a PhD in history and literature from Boston University. She has been a frequent guest on NPR and the CBC, including spots on the weekend edition and The Current. From 1999 to 2002, she was Ellie Wiesel's teaching assistant at Boston University. Currently, she is an associate professor of English at Endicott College. Please join me in welcoming Charlotte Gordon. Thank you to Sandy. Thank you so much um, to the Brattleboro Literary Festival. It's so fun to be here. And I'm so excited to be talking with Kate. I, this is my first time meeting Kate, but I heard her talk on NPR about a year ago. Um, and I thought, I, mean, I guess it was more than a year ago when Spinsters just had come out. And I thought, Kate is writing my book, but in an entirely different way. And this is so exciting. So what I think both Kate and I are interested in is the idea of legacy. What do we inherit? Why do we inherit it? And how, how do we inherit? And I wrote Romantic Outlaws because I had, of course, always heard of Mary Shelley, who wrote Frankenstein, but I never really fully realized that Mary Wollstonecraft was her mother. And when I found this out, this may seem, you know, humdrum to you, but when I found this out, I was really dumbstruck because it just made so much sense to me that the amazing pioneering author of A Vindication of the Rights of Women would be the mother of the author of Frankenstein. Like, of course, cool Mary Wollstonecraft would influence Mary Shelley. And I thought, if, if I didn't know that Mary Shelley had this legacy from her mother, I'm sure most people don't know this. And when I think about Kate, Kate's, well, Kate will talk more about this, but Kate's book in many ways is about how we need to have a wider variety of possible selves, a wide, especially as women. We need to have not just role models, but an ability to imagine different futures for, for ourselves than the ones our culture currently you know, gives to us. So Mary Shelley was really fortunate to have been born into a rear, she was not fortunate to have been born into a repressive era, but she was fortunate to have as, as a mother, Mary Wollstonecraft, who broke every rule there was to break. But uh, when I was sort of undergoing my first thrills of excitement that Mary Wollstonecraft was Mary Shelley's mother, I was, my, my thoughts about this relationship were dashed when I realized that Mary Wollstonecraft had in fact died 10 days after giving birth to Mary Shelley. I thought, well, wait, you know, how, how does a dead mother influence her daughter? And then I thought, now, wait a second. I personally am influenced by many dead people. And I suspect everyone in this audience is. And I think that um, one of the most interesting things about Mary Wollstonecraft's influence on Mary Shelley and all the rest of us is that Mary Wollstonecraft was so prolific 
and so opinionated that we're really able, I think, to get a sense of what she was like as a person and how brave and pioneering she was as a person. So here's just a couple of things that Mary Wollstonecraft did so that we can all expand our imaginative grasp of how to live a life. Uh, Mary Wollstonecraft was pretty much born outraged. She had a horrible, abusive, drunken father. She had a weak, irritating mother. And yet, as the eldest daughter in this family, one of, their, one of the first stories about Wollstonecraft that you'll find when you start to read about her is that she used to sleep on the threshold of her parents' bedroom to protect her mother from her drunken father when he would come home at night from the bars. This was her first exposure to marriage, and you can probably guess she didn't think highly of it. She also was born the 18th century, when if you were married, you surrendered all of your rights if you were a woman. You didn't get to own any property. You had no right to a divorce. A uh, husband's job was to discipline you. The only rule was that the whip should be no thicker than your thumb. That's where we get the idea of the rule of thumb. And uh, this was considered absolutely necessary because women were like children. They needed structure. They needed order. You know, their minds were weak. Their most important organ was their uterus so that they could produce, you know, lots of little babies. And so Mary Wilson-Krupp hated this. And in fact, Kate and I were talking beforehand about what makes a Mary Wollstonecraft a Mary Wollstonecraft. Like why, given her circumstances, given her culture, why was she such a rebel? Why didn't she just kind of fold up in despair, follow the, you know, the path she was supposed to follow? We don't really know, but it's certainly... We can talk more about that. Um, it certainly does make one think that she really was extraordinary. There was something unusual about Wollstonecraft that she was able to really go her own way in the face of enormous criticism. So after this sort of horrible childhood, she manages to get free of her family by working for a living. And in the 18th century, your, your employment opportunities as a middle-class woman were not you know, extensive. Uh, you could be a governess, you could be the companion to an elderly person, or you could teach school, none of which were things that Mary Wollstonecraft was interested in, though she did all of them. And in each one of them, she left a kind of fireball behind her. So she, she starts a school in the most radical part of London where she teaches little girls that they should think for themselves and you know exercise and eat lots of food and be strong and stuff. And so the school folds, of course, because no one agrees with her. So then she's hired as a governess in Ireland where, she's work, where she works for a very wealthy family. And I, I just look back and I think, can you imagine hiring Mary Wollstonecraft as your governess? I mean, I, I don't know what they thought they were getting, but they get Mary Wollstonecraft. That lasts, of course, less than a year. She's fired. But during the course of that year, she's able to entirely turn the family upside down, so much so that the eldest daughter, uh, she do, the eldest daughter does get married briefly, but then she runs away from her husband, cross-dresses as a man, uh, enrolls in medical school in Germany, falls in love with someone else, and then spends the rest of her life in Italy being a doctor and you know, having a good life. Why, she was asked later, you know, as she, as she was nearing her own death, she said, my governess, Mary Wollstonecraft. Uh, but this is, this is just sort of the prelude to Mary Wollstonecraft's life. These are just some incidents in her life that sort of give you an idea of what person, kind of person she was. But after she got fired as a governess, she went to London and she did the extraordinary thing of earning her living with her own pen. She's the first woman really to do so. I mean, there is the playwright Afro Bain, you know, about 100 years before that, who was kind of man managed to make a living. But Wollstonecraft really is a working writer. She's the first woman to be that. And she, that didn't hold her back at all. She felt this is exactly what she should be doing. She said, I am going to break the mold. This is who I am. I am extraordinary. Look out, world. And she published her first sort of significant book was called a vindication of the rights of men. Now, my students are always astonished by this. They thought, you know, wait, I thought she wrote a vindication of the rights of women. Well, she did, but her first book was a vindication of the rights of men, and she was deeply inspired by the works of John Locke. And again, whenever I say that, my students' eyes roll back in their head with boredom. All I have to do is say John Locke. They're like, oh. But 
in the 18th century, John Locke was considered so radical that you weren't even allowed to have his books at Oxford. And why is that? Well, he said things like, if your government is tyrannical or repressive, you have the right to overturn that government. And he meant that in domestic situations just as much as in public life. So if your father was repressive or abusive, you had the right to rebel against him. If your husband was, you had the right to rebel against him. And he said, you know what? All of us are born with a blank slate. All of us, men and women alike. And when Mary Wollstonecraft read that, she, her life was changed. She had found sort of the philosophical basis for her feelings, which is that we are all equal. And so her first essay, well, which is a book-length essay, sort of burst onto the scene, and people were very impressed by it. They had no idea, of course, it was written by a woman. And uh, she received lots of praise until it went into a second edition when she and her publisher thought, I know, let's go ahead and say who wrote this. Immediately, when the second edition came out with Mary Wollstonecraft's name on it, all the critics came out of the woodwork and said, this is messy, this is sloppy, clearly, you know, this woman shouldn't be writing, it's incoherent, what is she thinking, women shouldn't do stuff like this, but that didn't stop Mary Wollstonecraft, she sat right down and she wrote A Vindication of the Rights of Woman, because she wasn't done yet. And at the end of that, she didn't bother to disguise her identity with that book. At the end of that, people said, you are a whore, a hyena in petticoats. How can you say that women should have rights? And in fact, this reputation persisted so that up through the end of the 19th century, if you looked up whore in the English dictionary or in, in the, even in the encyclopedia, it said, see Mary Wollstonecraft as an example. <laughs> so this was, I know. This was Mary Wollstonecraft. Um, I want to keep this short, but I, I, I knew I wanted to talk a lot about Mary Wollstonecraft because I wanted you to have this kind of opportunity, I guess, that Mary Shelley had and then I had, which is to expand your ideas about what it meant to be a woman in the 18th century, that there were, there were um, many more possibilities then, I think, than anyone imagined, and Wollstonecraft lived them all. When the French Revolution broke out and all of the English were streaming home from Paris because there was so much violence, Wollstonecraft jumped on the first ship to Paris so that she could be a foreign correspondent. She was psyched when she landed. She's like, yes, the guillotine, the peasants are uprising. Of course the aristocrats should be on the run. This is just how life should be. I am where I should be. Oh, she was thrilled. She falls in love for the first time with this sexy American. And, you know, marriage, of course, should have no place in this new world order in the midst of the French Revolution. So they, as, as my mother used to say, so they shacked up together. But it was perfect. She'd found her soulmate. Everything was great. She got pregnant. Yay. She had the baby. The baby was healthy. Everything was perfect. And he abandons her. So now, again, Wollstonecraft shows her resilience, and I tell you this story because her daughter, Mary Shelley, is going to know this entire story by heart also. Mary Wollstonecraft is so depressed and in such despair that she tries to kill herself, but the sexy American has a really dumb idea, though it works well for Mary Wollstonecraft. He had lost, he was a businessman, and he had lost one, lost one of his one of his commercial ships had gone missing in Scandinavia. Scandinavia? I mean, if you lived in England in the 18th century, you'd barely heard of Scandinavia, let alone, you know, the thought of visiting Scandinavia was not on anyone's radar. But um, Mary's uh, uh, recovering from her suicide attempt. Uh, Gilbert, who's the sexy American, comes to her and her little toddler now, and he says, Mary, I know, I know you're in despair, but if you could go to Scandinavia for me and find this ship, maybe I could find it in my heart to love you again. Oh, says Mary Wollstonecraft, great. Off she went with toddler to Scandinavia, where again, let me just reiterate, no one went to Scandinavia. She goes to Scandinavia, she looks for the ship, she doesn't find it. But what she does find is that roaming around in nature and looking at waterfalls and stuff, and you know, smelling the pines, and then going home and writing about it, made her feel better. And when she came home from Scandinavia without the ship, Gilbert said, well, you didn't find the ship, so forget it. Um, 
she doesn't give in. Instead, she publishes these letters. It's her best-selling book. It's called Letters from Scandinavia. And it was read by a lot of very interesting young men. Two among them, named Coleridge and Wordsworth, were so struck by it, they thought, hey, this idea of wandering around in nature and having thoughts and feelings and then writing about it is really good. Maybe we should try it. And we had, you know, the birth of romanticism, which is not how it was taught to me in college, by the way. There was never any mention of Wollstonecraft. So Wollstonecraft uh, is, is now a celebrity, and she meets a kind of rock star political scientist philosopher named William Godwin uh, right about this time period. And they fall in love. Of course, what are they going to do? Are they going to get married? They don't want to because neither of them believe in marriage, but they're concerned about the fate of their new child because Wollstonecraft is pregnant again. They decide to get married. All of their friends make fun of them, but they do it. And that little baby that is born is little Mary, soon to be Shelley. Everything is great for the first 10 days until Mary Wollstonecraft dies, but then uh, little, the little baby is left just with her kind of rigid, cold, father. I won't tell you more than that, but he was sort of a jerk, actually. But anyway, she's left alone with her father, and he's in mourning, of course. He's just lost his beloved partner, soulmate, and wife, Mary Wollstonecraft, and the way he grieves is he takes little Mary to her gravestone almost every day. That's where he teaches her to read. So her first letters are tracing her mother's name, Mary, which is also her name, on her gravestone over and over again, until she kind of memorizes, you know, her dead mother, herself, we are one. I don't, you know, we don't really have the time to discuss the, <laughs> the, <laughs> the ripple effects that, that, that clearly this had on little Mary. But um, she also lived in a house that was kind of a shrine to Mary Wollstonecraft. Every single uh, book that Wollstonecraft had ever written was, of course, on the shelves. And there was a huge portrait of her mom hanging in the front hall, and her mom is pregnant with little Mary Shelley. And so by the time she was maybe 12 years old, uh, young Mary had decided that she was going to live according to her mother's ideals. She was going to keep that flag up and make sure to keep the Wollstonecraft ideas alive in the world. And uh, this meant that when she met a very handsome and deep young poet named Percy when she was 16. She was ready to fall in love. Did it matter that Percy was already married? No. Should they be together? Yes. She takes him to her very favorite place, her mother's gravestone, where she flings herself into his arms and says, I love you, Percy. And he says, oh, I love you too, Mary. And she says, we should run away together. He says, okay. Uh, where? She says, Paris, because that's where my mother went. And so off they go to Paris, leaving behind his young wife, who's, you know, pregnant. And um, do they have any regrets? No, because they're following their hearts. What do they bring with them? Not, you know, sexy lingerie or anything like that for their fun elopement. They bring every single one of Wollstonecraft's books, which they read to each other throughout Europe. I, know, I love that little detail. Anyway, um, I'm almost out of time because I want us to have the chance to hear how um, Kate's book and my book coincide. But suffice to say that Mary's life, young Mary's life, doesn't get um, more dull after this initial elopement with Percy. She lives a life of high drama um, throughout Europe and England. She's only 18 years old when she starts writing Frankenstein. It's published by the time she's 20. She goes on and writes five more novels. She writes a lot of nonfiction, all of which is dedicated to the ideal of equality, social justice, peace, etc. And why does she do that? Because of Mary Wollstonecraft, she says over and over again in her writings. And I think as I was discovering all this as, you know, realizing gradually that I was going to end up having to write a book about Wollstonecraft and Shelley because no one else had, I realized that my own imagination was expanding and extending through my immersion in both of these women. And I think that's why I thought I had to write the book, is I thought everyone should 
have this opportunity of reading about these extraordinary women and the very brave choices they made because certainly no one said to them as they were breaking the rules, that's great, break some more rules, go ahead, be radical. They suffered enormously. They suffered exile and humiliation after humiliation. So um, they're kind of amazing examples for us to encounter. I think they certainly gave me courage, and I hope that if you, you know, if you read the book, I hope that they will give you courage as well. So now, on to Kate. Charlotte. And I think in a year when women have been in the forefront of the news really challenging patriarchal behavior, it seems particularly appropriate that we have these two wonderful authors here today whose books challenge the roles that women are expected to hold in society. Um, in 2011, fa fast forward, Kate, wrote, Kate Bollock wrote a piece in um, The Atlantic titled All the Single Ladies which centered on the idea that women might choose not to marry. It was the genesis for her first book, Spinster, The Making of a Life of One's Own. It was a bestseller <clears throat> named on the New York Times Notable uh, Books of 2015. Kate is a contributing editor for The Atlantic. She's also a freelance writer for The New York Times, Slate, Vogue, and other publications. And she is the host of Touchstones at the Mount, which is an annual interview series at the Edith Wharton Country Estate in Lenox, Mass, if any of you have ever been to that. Previously, she was the executive editor of Domino and a columnist for the Boston Globe's Idea section. She teaches creative nonfiction at the New York University at NYU, and she, <laughs> she lives in Brooklyn, New York. Uh, Bollock has appeared on the Today Show, CBS Morning, Sunday Morning, CNN, Fox <laughs> News, MSNBC, and numerous NPR programs throughout the country. Please join me in welcoming Kate Bollock. I am so happy to be here. I love Vermont so much. I am thrilled to be meeting Charlotte Gordon. I am in awe of the work that she does. And I, I bought Romantic Outlaws right when it came out and didn't read it right away until a couple of months ago. And when I started reading it, I almost started crying because it's she's our books are so related. <laughs> it was it so San, it was just it was genius of Sandy to put us together. So what I'm going to do is read to you an essay that appears at the back of the paperback edition of the book. So um, and it will take about 15 minutes. So prepare yourselves. Um, but before I do that, I'll just tell you quickly a few things, which is that, um, as Sandy mentioned, I, um, this book came out of an article I'd written for The Atlantic about this historic demographic shift that we are all living inside of right now, where in America we have more single people than married people. So this has been the case since about 2010. And when I, as a journalist, came across that statistic, I, my, my heart started racing. Like, this is, oh my God, I'm part of this demographic shift. I'm, you know, at the time I was 39 years old, never been married. I, I kept being confused by that. Like, why am I not married yet? I should be married now, but I kept never wanting to be married. It was confusing to me. And so to see that I was part of something that I hadn't known that I was a part of, and to be able to put myself inside of my own historical context was... was uh, blew my mind. Uh, so I, I write this article, you know, and, and as, you know, any writer, I think, you know, I'm writing away and um, hoping somebody reads it, who knows, you know, it just might drop, and it goes viral, and I hear from scores of young women and women my age, you know, all wanting to talk about marriage and not marriage, and what does it mean, and blah, 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 you know, all the, these questions. Uh, and, and then meanwhile, the media was just, you know, trotting me around all these news shows and so forth and um, acting like this was the newest news in the world. And I felt frustrated by this because I knew that this was just uh, the, the most recent iteration of a long 
conversation that had started with Mary Wollstonecraft and, you know, gone on and moved around the globe. I'm fascinated about, you know, when, how do ideas move? How do they, how do they move geographically? How do they move historically? When do we get them? Why did I, as a woman who had grown up with the gains of the women's movement and with a feminist mother, how, why was in the year 2000 when I was hitting 30 marriage age and so forth, you know, why wasn't I seeing positive depictions of unmarried women around me at all? Where had that conversation gone? Because I knew it had happened before. Uh, and meanwhile, I had, so when I, okay, so, so I wanted to return this contemporary conversation to its historic context. That was the goal of my book. And uh, when my agent was, was shopping it around, she was saying in the meetings, it's kind of like, you know that children's book, um, Are You My Mother? Are you my mother? <laughs> that, it's like the little duck or whatever that goes around the king. Um, that's kind of what my book is because it turned. So my my uh, my mother had died when she was fifty two and I was twenty three, and I, I spent my twenties looking not for mother surrogates exactly, but for people to have the kinds of conversations with that I had had with her when she was alive. And um, so I'm, I'm going to start with a little thing just because it it's so um, you'll it just it's like right out of your book. Uh, Childhood is the kingdom where nobody dies, Edna St. Vincent Millay once wrote. I was 23 when my mother died, long past childhood. But like most progeny of the middle class, I'd indulged in unthinking helplessness about my parents longer than I should have, an entitlement to what I felt I was owed, a willful blindness to their lives as individuals with needs of their own. There had been a fluke telephone conversation a few months before her death when it struck me that though my mother and I spoke candidly and often, there was a part of herself she held in reserve, that she was waiting for me to get just a little older, a few years maybe. Uh, by the time, maybe by the time I was 30, I hazarded, married and with my own family, to talk to me frankly about herself, woman to woman, and the two strands of our lives necessarily divided by my growing into my own person would twine back together into one long rope and she'd unburden herself of the secrets she carried, and I'd learned things about her I'd never known. And so I couldn't shake the conviction that we'd been robbed. She'd raised me in her image to be the one true friend she'd never had, and now neither of us would ever know the conversations we'd waited for all our lives. There was a sickening symmetry to her losing her first breast just as I began to wear a bra, and then exiting her adult her adulthood at midlife, at the moment I embarked on mine, as if I were still a parasitic fetus leeching her of blood and calcium. You are born, you grow up, you become a wife. You delay your ambitions, you raise your family, you're struck down by cancer at midlife. It was resolved. I had my own aspirations to live out, but also hers. So now I'm going to jump to this... Uh, essay, which is called Afterlives. For most of my life, I had only one memory of my mother's first mastectomy. On the day she returned home from the hospital, she took my little brother and me into the bathroom and lifted up her shirt. She was 40, he was 6, I was 10, and the three of us looked at her reflection in the mirror rather than directly at her chest. The thick red scar where her right breast had been was a violent surprise, like a gash in an oil po portrait of a mother and her children. She explained surgery and cancer and remission, and we asked questions. Then we all went out for pizza. And so her illness became an everyday fact of our lives, though illness seems too loaded a word for a woman as healthy and vital as she was, all fresh green vegetables and swimming laps at the YWCA three days a week. She never once made me worry or feel afraid. My own breasts were just starting to develop, however, and as puberty molded me into her same shape, I decided it just wasn't possible to look and be so much like her and not also harbor the same disease. Cancer is like a secret that insists on being known. When I was in college, I asked my mother if she believed in an afterlife, and she said no. This didn't surprise me. She'd finished Catholic school and atheist, but it bothered me. I reasoned with her. None of us can say for certain there's no life after death because we're still alive. And what if there is an afterlife, and by refusing to believe in it, you lose your right to send signs from beyond the grave? 
And how about this? Let's just agree to agree that there is an afterlife. <laughs> and if there is, when one of us dies, we can send signs. And if there isn't, that's that. But at least we'll have the option. She laughed and said, no, thank you. <laughs> A year later, after her cancer had reemerged and killed her more swiftly than we'd ever thought possible, I thought of this conversation often and was annoyed. Thanks for, me, thanks for leaving me alone in this cold, echoing void, Mom. Would it have hurt her to humor me? <laughs> to at least be on the lookout for signs from beyond would have been a comfort. I envied people who deluded themselves by visiting mediums or psychics, and I bridled at those who said my mother was watching over me. Maybe other mothers did such a thing, but not mine. In my 30s, I developed the habit of returning home to Newburyport, Massachusetts, at least once a year, and working out of my mother's office on the second floor, which remained entirely as she'd left it. When she was alive, I'd had no interest in journalism, and now here I was, writing for magazines and newspapers exactly where she had. My father eventually dismantled her bulky first-generation PC and put the hard drive in the closet, but her desk, an old wooden door laid across two metal filing cabinets heavy with hanging file folders, didn't budge. All I had to do to spend hours in her company was open a drawer. And yet I never did. In 2012, when I started writing this book, I spent the entire summer in that office. Every morning, I'd walk upstairs with a mug of coffee and sit down at that makeshift desk. Not once was I tempted to open a drawer. When I needed to confirm a factual detail about her life, I'd email and call her brothers and friends, as if the answers weren't already there at knee level. I told myself this is what resistance feels like. If I opened one of the drawers, something like her soul might slip out, and then I'd have nothing of her left. It was frightfully easy to imagine her on that last just another workday morning, finishing up a reporting call, dropping her notes into a folder, Suddenly realizing she was running late, shoving the drawer shut, grabbing her purse, and driving into Boston for a routine doctor's appointment, never to return. Her descent was so abrupt. How many articles did she abandon mid-draft? Did anyone call her editors to explain what had happened? She died too soon, hadn't had time to hit her stride to create something that would endure. Those files didn't merely contain the last gasp of her living spirit, they were graveyards of journalistic ephemera, tragic monuments to all she'd never achieved. And in this way, a cautionary tale, a physical reminder of what would happen if I didn't hurry up and get my life in motion and make use of however much time I had remaining. My first thought when the surgeon told me I had breast cancer was, of course, I finally wrote a book, now I die. That sounds far more dramatic than I felt, when I turned 39 without receiving my own diagnosis, then 40, then 41, I'd grown uneasy. Had I been crazy all this time? Was I actually going to skate through life evading the dreaded sea? But I had to wait only one more year. On that bright, cold afternoon in December 2014, I was primarily relieved. This particular shoe had finally dropped. I watched the surgeon very closely to make sure I caught everything he said with his words and his face. His blue eyes narrowed in an expression that demanded I pay attention. This is the best cancer you could have. Stage 1A, tiny tumor, very responsive to treatment. You are not going to die from this. You should thank your body for being so good to you. I scribbled his words in my notebook, then I stopped. I'm not going to die from this, I said. You are not going to die from this, he said. In January, he, we, he wheeled me into an operating room and I was put under general anesthesia. First, he made an incision in my left areola, tunneled down to nearly my rib cage and removed the malignant tumor. Then he cut into my armpit and retrieved three lymph nodes to confirm the cancer hadn't spread. When the surgery was over, I took a cab home to Brooklyn. Two friends came over with takeout. It was the follow-up consultation in February that caught me off guard. Before treatment could be determined, the surgeon explained, I needed to be tested for the BRCA mutation, a genetic anomaly that can impair a body's ability to suppress tumors. If I had it, a double mastectomy was advised. I'd never doubted that I had the mutation. Doctor, I said, I don't have time for an amputation. 
I was joking, but not really. The initial irony of dying just as my first book came out had seemed grimly appropriate and frankly much easier. This more concrete likelihood of getting both of my breasts removed as publication day neared was like sprinting headfirst into an oncoming train. How could these two things happen simultaneously? But on March 11th, I learned I don't have the BRCA mutation. On March 16th, I began seven weeks of daily radiation. On April 21st, Spinster was published, and I paused radiation to go on book tour. On May 11th, it was over. Three months later, in August, while home visiting my father, I walked upstairs to my mother's office, crossed the room, and before I knew what I was doing, I grabbed the handle of one of her filing cabinets. The drawer slid open, the first time in 19 years. My eyes immediately landed on a folder labeled mastectomy, which I recognized as a freelancer's catch-all. Notes, drafts, research, pathology reports. Confronted by the evidence, I suddenly remembered that two years after my mother's first mastectomy, she'd written about it for Boston Magazine. I brought the folder to the armchair and cringed to think why I'd forgotten this essay. When I was in college and my mother had tried to share her work with me, I'd privately dismissed the subjects she covered, such as breast cancer and divorce, as frivolous women's journalism, the sort of writing that I, a poet in the making, was above. I'd responded arrogantly, and in the ensuing years had pushed the exchange and the essay out of mind. There was a stapled photocopy of the article, Diagnosis Malignant, published in July 1985. Almost everything I read was news to me. Turns out she was 37 when she first felt the lump in her breast. She made an appointment with her local doctor, who passed it off as nothing, and continued to say it was nothing for two years, even though it kept getting bigger. It was her dear friend Maureen who urged her to see a specialist in Boston. He took one look, decided the lump was a malignant tumor that had been growing for nearly a decade, and scheduled her to come back in 10 days for a biopsy. She was terrified, and rightly so, given the severity of her diagnosis and the probable outcome. Those 10 days in limbo waiting for the biopsy were the worst, she wrote. The terror gnawed at my stomach, macabre fingers of fear squeezed my neck. Surprisingly, I didn't dream of dying, but my conscious mind hardly gave me a break. I felt like Wiley E. Coyote in the old Saturday morning Roadrunner cartoons, blissfully unaware that he's run off the cliff until he looks down at the canyon yawning below his whirling feet. I learned that in 1983, it was still common for a woman to be admitted to the hospital for a biopsy, wait there for the results, and then undergo the surgery, in her case, a nearly two-week ordeal. The folder held a typewritten letter. Apparently suspecting she'd be away for a while, She'd supplied a note to my father, reminding him which days to pick up my brother and me from play rehearsal or soccer practice, and not to forget our Tuesday night treat of one TV show. She underwent chemotherapy for 57 weeks. She lost her hair in big, furry clumps, but refused to wear a wig, because doing so felt too much like giving in. She continued working and seeing friends and swimming laps at the Y. Overall, she reported feeling almost lucky. I don't go around town shouting about the virtues of cancer, she wrote, but I do believe that dealing with death as an immediate possibility rather than as a phantom terror has enriched me. Contracting cancer certainly won't make you like it, but assuming that you work through the pain and come out intact, or partially intact, as I did, you realize that the lessons cloaked in fear are the invaluable ones that most people simply don't learn. Cancer taught me much more about life than it did about death, although I learned a lot about that, too. The mid-1980s were still the early years of what's now known as breast cancer awareness, when women were newly speaking openly about what had long been treated as a shameful condition and seeking a sort of sisterhood, the now ubiquitous uh, Pink Ribbon campaign launched in 1991. Hardly the frivolous women's journalism I'd once dismissed it as being, her article was a crucial step in this process. Breast cancer is not a feminist disease, just as not all spinsters are feminists, as people sometimes ask me. 
But because centuries of patriarchy have distorted every aspect of the female experience, both were stigmatized and, misunder and misunderstood until radical 1970s feminist activists made them political issues. This doesn't mean one needs to be radical or an activist to be a feminist, of course. Feminism is an ecosystem of ideas that relies on a diversity of temperaments to be generated and disseminated. There are brazen trailblazers. Oh, and these are the women I write about in the book. Uh, there are brazen trailblazers like Charlotte Perkins Gilman, who galvanized audiences by lecturing timelessly on equal rights. There are solitary geniuses like Maeve Brennan, who, in co-opting the male tradition of the urban flaneur, gave voice to the experience of being a woman alone when marriage rates were at their highest, all without once identifying herself as a feminist. There are small town freelance journalists like my mother who carried the torch lit by crusaders into the mainstream by writing about cancer for popular magazines. Combined, their efforts brought the disease the public attention and research funding it had long been denied. When I finished reading the Xerox, a new memory reared up. After that first mastectomy, my mother became something of a one woman hotline for the similarly afflicted. Sometimes I'd come home from school to find her comforting a stranger on a headscarf over a pot of tea. I pictured a gum wrapper with her name and number in smudged pencil being passed from one suburban patient to the next. It wasn't some ideal of female saintliness that motivated her, but the unshakable conviction that talking is transformative, that save for death itself, everything is improved with honest conversation, whether in, the per in person or on the page. For the first decade after her death, I wore my mother's rings and never removed them. One was too big, and I worried constantly that it would slip off my finger and be lost forever. Finally, it did. I returned home from shopping at a vintage clothing boutique and realized it was gone. Rather than call the store and ask if they'd found it, I decided to let it go. It was time I stopped constantly reminding myself that I'd lost her. My mother's fate wasn't mine after all, genetically or sociologically. Just as I'd once been wrong to believe that I needed what she had, marriage, children, to find meaning and be happy, I was wrong to think myself her biological clone. I really am my own woman, apart from her. More crucially, I'd inherited a world that she'd had a part in making. I still believe my mother had much more left to do, but reading her essay, I understood that she'd already done important work for women in general and for me personally. 30 years later, I'd go in for my annual mammogram and a series of highly sophisticated MRI and ultrasound tests would detect the presence of a minuscule, minuscule malignancy lurking at the very bottom of my breast. While a team of doctors analyzed these results, I'd wait in the lobby tweeting with acquaintances about breast pancakes. <laughs> Each breast is flattened between two plates and those weird pasty things for nipples. A long way from the days when a woman was sent home to worry alone about a lump she could both see and touch. By expanding the conversation around breast cancer, my mother had done much more for me than send those signs from beyond that I'd once craved. During my own first brush with cancer, I'd been surprised and relieved to find myself thinking that were I to die right now, I wouldn't mind too much because at least I'd finally made my life the way I wanted it. Maybe it took me so long to open a drawer because I couldn't risk discovering that my mother had, after all, achieved her ambitions. If I did, I'd lose the drive to achieve my own. Or maybe I just needed to show myself that I could stand without her before I could admit that she'd been there all along. So thanks. So do you want to come up and we'll talk? Um, before we open it up to questions, I wanted to say something after listening to Kate's gorgeous reading, which is I was thinking this morning when I was running, I was thinking, really, I keep forgetting that Kate's book is named Spinster because I think of it so much as a conversation between her and her mother which is, of course, what my book is about. Um, and I think that's why it was so astonishing to me that we would get to work together today because uh, when I read the book a year ago, I remember thinking this is the sort of modern-day you know, project that Romantic Outlaws is also, this idea of the conversation between parent and child, mother and daughter, 
although in both cases the mother is dead. But of course, in both cases, we resurrect that mother. Yeah, and so I, I really like thinking of spinster as being on this continuum of uh, starting with, you know, Wollstonecraft was having these ideas first, and then they kind of popped up at different points in history. Uh, and so here we are today where it's finally happened. You know, all of that questioning and work has, has changed the way that people live. But we're still living in a time when it's that conversation. It, I, I feel like it's happening now, but it, it's, it's, um, it's still confusing. And I think partly that's because uh, marriage is personal and political. So it's a, a kind of, it, needs to, it needed to be changed in the 18th century because it was a terrible institution in which women were abused. So here we are today, we do have marriages of equals. It's finally happened, and it's, but, the, uh, but there's still a lot of uh, repression involved to it. Or, and mostly I think I see the repression as being around how young women are li leading their lives thinking that they have to get married to be happy. And... Uh, and so it's a matter of, you know, okay, so, so the women I write about in my book uh, were all lived at the turn of this last century, uh, and, and eight, late 1800s, early 1900s, and that was because I wanted to show the conversation that was happening. Uh, there are so many parallels between now and then. That's, that's why. Th there were more women than ever before who were unmarried in the late 1800s, and there was a, a public conversation around that and around being single, the new woman. There was a lot of pride. And then that all got, you know, um, absorbed over the course of the 20th century. That, you know, went back underground until the, the second wave of the women's movement. Uh, wait, now I've already lost my point. Uh, <laughs> Well, we could, we could probably open it up to questions in case there are any. Otherwise, we'll continue to chat amongst ourselves. Yeah. I was just hearing what you were saying. It seems that the war, World War II, uh, had such an effect to put women back into a place where they weren't previously because one of my grandmothers was a war correspondent in the 20s. And she, well, mm -hmm. she what, lived in the 20s and then, of course, in the 40s was a war correspondent. But she and her colleagues were so liberating in the first um, you know, 40 years of the century. And then my mother was not, <laughs> and then liberated herself after her divorce and began her wonderful career. But so is that, I'm just- Yes, that's exactly- yeah, that's exactly the point I was trying to make. And, and what it, the, the words I was thinking of is that, that at the, in the late 1800s, they were actually tearing off the, the actual corsets. You know, just metaphorically, I love the idea of corsets. They were creating these new lives. And today, I think of it as invisible corsets, that there are the, this, the kind of struggle now around gender and, and relation and so forth is um, a lot harder to see. I also think that something that at least our students don't seem to realize is that at least, um, I don't know if this is true of your students, Kate, but my students think that human history has been one long, steady kind of escalator ride of progress. Right. Things are you know, always getting better. And I always try to make clear to them that in fact, women's history and the rights of women has not been a steady climb of progress. In fact, it was probably way better to be a woman in the 17th century in America than it was to be a 19th century woman in England. Because in 17th century America, you you know you didn't you couldn't wear a corset because you were chasing cows in the wilderness and fending off Native Americans, and you know you had a lot of stuff to do. Whereas in the 19th century, and then again in the 1950s, you as especially a middle class white woman had a lot to prove as a decorative item or as a, you know, a status symbol for your husband, et cetera. So um, I think that that's really important for people to understand how history has worked um, for women and for marginalized peoples. Yeah, and I, uh, listening to you talk about Mary Wollstonecraft, starting with the vindications of the rights of man and then women, I was reminded of uh, Gerda Lerner, the uh, historian, women's historian who made women's history and academic discipline, she was, you know, gobsmacked. Why, why had women never risen up? Why had they not fought their oppressors? So she decided that she would write a history of feminist consciousness and sat down to do it and realized, oh, God, I can't do this. First, I have to write a history of patriarchy, <laughs> and then I'll write the history of feminist consciousness. So um, I'm so grateful to her existence mm -hmm. also. No, and she just died, sadly. Yeah. 
Yeah. Oh, so, so okay. So, so, so the comment is is about women who have found ways to live inside of marriage by, by reinventing it and um, um, and maintaining their singlehood to some degree. Even if it's you know sort of perverse on their you know right. Or, or yeah. not necessarily. I, I looked. I just looked into it in the sense that um, well, I, from my book, yeah, I write about five women. All of them were married at some point. I intersect them when they're unmarried uh, for the purposes of, of the narrative, but. Um, Neith Boyce, uh, well, th so Edna St. Vincent Millay had an open marriage, that was her solution, uh, and lived in a menage a trois for a while. Uh, um, Neith Boyce was uh, a late 1800s journalist and novelist who agreed to marry her husband on the condition of pure equality, and he was a free love uh, varietist, is what they were called, and, and he uh, really tried to get her into it, and she just wasn't interested. She didn't really care, but they ended up having a pretty tumultuous marriage, so that the, you know, ironically, her, the, the principles and ideas that brought her into it ended up subsuming her because she wasted so much energy on dealing with Hutch, who was just such a pain in the ass, and always sleeping around and telling her all about it. Um, and then Charlotte Perkins Gilman is a great example because she was, she, she got married young, you know, it's partly because um, it, she was at 16, she had said, I'm never marrying, that is not for me, I have the world to change, I have things to do. She was born in 1860. Um, wasn't going to marry, and then fell in love with a really hot guy, and she, you know, wanted to have sex with him, <laughs> and had to marry him to do it. So she marries him, and they have a lost weekend, and she gets pregnant, and uh, and then has the child, and and has the most famous postpartum in American letters, uh, and ends up leaving him and and the daughter, and um, and spends the next ten years of her life living on her own, and uh, and then falls in love again and gets married, and and that marriage really worked out for her. So anyway, I'm I'm sort of those are the examples that I was looking into, but I didn't look more widely than that. I think in many ways Mary Wollstonecraft is one one of the sort of most interesting pioneering examples she gives us is of her marriage to William Godwin. So William Godwin is the father of Mary Shelley, and he was, as I said a rock star political philosopher who was famous and is still famous today in certain circles for being the father of anarchism. And he had written about how marriage was an unjust institution. And so for these two, before he met Wollstonecraft, so for Wollstonecraft and Godwin to get married, who they were both these outspoken critics of marriage, they, as I said before, were ridiculed mercilessly by friends and critics alike. But they also went about their marriage in such a way that it's still, there's still, we, I think we still feel its ripple effect. So that, for example, Virginia Woolf would, would about 100 years later say perhaps the most important example that Wollstonecraft left us was her radical marriage to Godwin. Why was it so radical? They did buy a house together or a, I guess we'd say condo now, but <laughs> um, they kept a separate residence for Godwin so that he would work there and she would work at their house. And because of the separate residences, this is just delicious for someone like me because they kept all of their notes back and forth to each other. And so you can go to the Bodleian Library at Oxford and you can read all of their little marital, you know, basically emails. And they are <laughs> so contemporary sounding. So, you know, they range from things like, honey, I left my spectacles over at your office. Could you bring them <laughs> to, I think we're having lamb chops for dinner, okay, <laughs> to my favorite one by Mary Wollstonecraft, which goes something like this. I have had the most irritating morning, Godwin. I thought we had agreed that our time was equal, that we are both engaged on important topics. But in fact, the plumber came today and ruined my whole morning, and where were you? It's like, oh, that's my life. So, you know, this is 1797, 1796 that she's writing this. And so when you, when you go back and you review these, you see she wasn't just a political philosopher. She was also a novelist. She was someone who was trying to put these ideas into action. How do I live as an equal? And she had to carve that path out. And so... Um, your grandmother, you know, was struggling in her own way, as do we all, when we're in a culture that is telling us to do one thing and we're trying to do it our own way. That was very classic Wollstonecraft, to try to find her own way going entirely against the tide. 
<laughs> we were talking, I, yeah. you know, Kate and I keep talking about that, like the mystery of Mary Wollstonecraft. It makes you believe, I mean, I do not believe this in the classroom. I mean, in my life, I think everybody, there's, you know, that we all have talent and we all have stories to tell. And yet, then you encounter these people like Mary Wollstonecraft. It makes you believe in, as Kate said, genius. There was something extraordinary about her. She was brave, I think, is what was most extraordinary about her. She had two sisters who managed to live the most unpleasant and bitter lives that you could imagine. Um, she took care of them as well as everybody else. Uh, but she, I think, when I think about who Wollstonecraft was, I, she was really brave. She was also really smart. And then here's the part that I think is so moving. She was someone who really allowed ideas and books to shape her life, to influence her. So that, for example, the reading of John Locke, which I know, I mean, my students, again, so boring sounding, but John Locke changed her life and she allowed him to. She allowed ideas to change her life and she believed that words mattered and she left us a legacy so that we can let our own lives be changed by these words and these ideas. So I think that's perhaps one of her greatest traits is this openness and commitment to ideas, words, and beliefs, and how she used them to steer her own course. Yeah, I, I think that's incredibly inspirational. Yeah, and I, I would add to that her regard for humankind and her openness to other mm. people. She was a really good, generous person. Mm. And when I think of her in those terms, I think of her in relation to Melville. I was mentioning mm. that earlier, but mm. when you, like, especially those first several chapters of Moby Dick, it's like, what? You know, this <laughs> feels like he wrote it right now. Yeah. And so, so there's that, con there's a kind of consciousness, mm. I think, that is capable of changing the consciousness of others because it's concerned with others. It's not an egotistical kind of mm. w relation to the world. It's, it's part of that kind of genius. The question is, um, were, there, were there examples or influences in Mary Wollstonecraft's childhood that might have helped influence her other than just the violence to which she was exposed? You know, it's funny, when I think about Wollstonecraft's childhood, it seems kind of like um, unalloyed violence and tyranny. So maybe that is the good recipe for how to create, you know. <laughs> <laughs> you know, she was furious. She was furious all the time. She had an elder brother, who, or an older brother who was an absolute tyrant and was allowed to be a tyrant by their mother. She had this abusive father. Her younger sister got married to an abusive husband. She helped that sister escape from that marriage, which was entirely illegal during that era and had to you know, endure death threats, et cetera. Um, I think that the only thing that I can see from her childhood that would have been a positive influence, again, were books books and ideas, and the one, um, well, I think this often, often not only were the books and the ideas changing her life, but they also brought her into close contact with friends, and I think that that was another characteristic of Wollstonecraft I haven't had the chance to talk about was her capacity for friendship mm -hmm. and passionate mm -hmm. friendship, and I think that those friends brought her books, those friends brought her ideas, those friends believed in her when no one else did. And certainly it wasn't her family who helped her except as an example of how not to be, but certainly it was her friends who gave her the strength and the courage and the belief in herself to, you know, to go forth and conquer. I, yeah, I wanna add something to that. Did, uh, uh, about when we were talking b before here about thinking about inheritances and, and what legacies that so we have the the inheritances that we are given you know by birth right right like my mother the way she raised me losing her what what I inherited from her and then in response to that I went out looking for new people to talk to so I was kind of choosing new inheritances or their early influences but in in the you know that the gay community really made. You know, that the choosing f your your own family idea a as a, a way of of living in life and and I think of my relationship to the women I write about was a bit like choosing my own family and the, so the role of friendship in expanding ourselves uh, I already lost my point again no, you're doing great yeah. <laughs> no that we we need that friendship sometimes that's a word we use trivially and you know the ancient Greeks were a lot smarter than us in this in this regard, which is they believed it, that friendship was one of the most sacred um, 
or the act of making a friend was one of the most sacred activities of the human race. And I think that that was really true for Wollstonecraft, whose romantic life was freighted with trauma and suffering, but whose friendships were deep and passionate and allowed her to experiment with ideas, but as I already said, gave her the strength to go forward. So let us all go forward and make lots of friends at this festival. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, read lots of books. <laughs> so shall we? Yeah, great note to end on, I think.